I would like you to know that Bolsonaro says that I do not represent anyone, that I'm not a chief. Bolsonaro comes from elsewhere. His ancestors are not from Brazil. As for me, I'm from this land and I'm a chief of my people. Hello, I'm Hushita, a master's student at the Graduate Institute, Geneva, and you just heard the voice of Kesiki Haoni addressing G7 leaders in 2019, denouncing the forest fires in the Amazon and the responsibility of the President Bolsonaro. He is the representative of the Kaipos, one of the many indigenous people's communities in Brazil. If we take into account that Brazil is one of the most biodiverse countries in the world, with one of the largest concentrations of indigenous groups and approximate of 300 groups, ranging from Brazil's cities to remote regions of the Amazon rainforest, it is clear that their struggle has become a widely spoken topic in the international community. With my colleagues Christina, Umberto and Alexander, we wanted to better understand what are indigenous people's rights and how these rights are articulated in a particular context, namely Brazil under Bolsonaro's presidency. In order to do so, we reached out to two specialists of indigenous people's rights. First, we contacted the director of DOSIP, Hemi Orsia, who kindly provided us with his expertise on the indigenous people's rights and the institutional aspect. But before talking about the rights of indigenous people in Brazil, we must address an essential question. What are the common grounds of indigenous peoples? Is it even relevant to find a definition? The general understanding within the UN documents, when they negotiated, indigenous representatives didn't want to have a close definition of indigenous peoples because they didn't want to close the door for newcomers or people that realize that maybe they can be defined as indigenous. So there is no clear legal definition of who is indigenous or not, but there are, I mean, some hints about who can claim it, um, his or her right as an indigenous people. So it's uh, people who lived for long in the same territory and who have a very strong link with this ter territory for their ways of living, but also spiritually, and um, who faced a form of uh, colonization at some point, and who generally became a minority in the place where they lived. So the definition is can be quite broad and can apply to several cases. But uh, also there's um, one point about uh, defining who is indigenous or not, is that um, people need to self-define themselves as indigenous peoples. And also there's the acknowledgement of the other indigenous peoples recognizing you as part of this general movement is also a way to be part of the indigenous people's rights international movement. Remy's response underlines the inclusivity of the definition based on a self-determination approach. Such a choice might be helpful strategically to form a large alliance among different indigenous communities, but it could lead to some confusion from a legal perspective over who is indigenous or not, and over the universality of the concept. That question remains voluntarily vague in order to foster a strong and self-determined international community of indigenous peoples. But to form an international alliance and raise awareness, you need to wander out of your territory or even country. So, how did indigenous representatives reach the international community? The first important person that came here in Geneva to claim uh, the rights for his people was back almost uh, 100 years ago when the um, chief from the Mohawk uh, tribe came in 1923 to the League of Nations to say we are a nation and um, our nation uh, was founded way before some of the nations that are here at the League of Nations so we want to sit at the table and it was never uh, received by anybody and uh, but, yeah th this was the first step and um, 
more than 50 years later, delegates came back with the idea that uh, indigenous people's rights should be respected as any human right. And uh, then they came in 1977 and they realized that they were facing states that were not uh, willing to discuss and, uh, and it was complicated and the states that had lots of uh, means to negotiate while they were on their own. So they asked for a um, structure or an entity to be created and that this was DOSIP. So the DOSIP was created at the request of indigenous peoples and by also uh, Genevans that were here that uh, were uh, uh, sensitized to the issue of uh, indigenous peoples' rights. Now that we have a clear view on who they are and how they manage to reach out to the international community, it is interesting to observe that the cause of indigenous people was quite successful in the global system. From a human rights perspective, the intense activism and coordination of indigenous representatives and Western NGOs, such as DOSIP, or Survival International definitely played a key role for the legacy of the cause. However, we should also stress the importance of the regional human rights systems in the Americas, Africa and Europe. They significantly foster the process. For instance, the jurisprudence of the inter-American system started a systematic approach on indigenous people's struggles in the late 1980s, with the most important action being taken in 1997. The Inter-American Commission voted and accepted the proposed American Declaration on Indigenous Peoples' Rights. For all these reasons, indigenous people finally had their rights recognized by the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People in 2007, a symbolic success for the cause. However, it is not a legally binding treaty and states should realize the ratification on a voluntary basis. So, has it been a helpful tool for indigenous people or just a more symbolic decision? For them it's a common reference between indigenous people, so it's a common ground, a common understanding that it's what should be achieved. And also, I would say that in the international mechanisms, for instance, the UPR, I mean, there are references that are made to the declaration to assess the achievement of the rights of indigenous peoples in the countries that are reviewed. So it's a way to use it. Uh, last year I was in, um, in Congo, in the Democratic Republic of Congo. I attended to a, a meeting with the Ministry of Interior, and it was very interesting for us work globally to see that these recommendations came back nationally and were considered as uh, clear directions that the states sh should take to uh, better respect indigenous people's rights. As Remy Orsi just told us, the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples constitutes a common reference for all the different indigenous communities around the world. In 2021, the United Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act came into force in Canada, showing a positive trend regarding the acknowledgement of indigenous communities and their struggles. But how are those rights expressed at a national level? How about Brazil and its 300 indigenous communities? For this, we had the help of Yami Gerbase from Survival International, a non-governmental and activist organization which was founded in 1969 as a response to all the persecution that indigenous peoples were facing during the Brazilian dictatorship. Inherited from the colonial era's conception, the indigenous communities were perceived for a long time as a second-class citizen who needed to be assimilated to the main civilized population. Under the dictatorship regime, from 1964 to 1985, their marginalization and oppression worsened due to an obsessive focus on economic development. Fortunately, during the redemocratization process in the 1980s, the new political context was way more favorable for indigenous peoples. And it was reflecting in the drafting of the constitution of 1988. But why? Which constitutional form did it take? Uh, after the dictatorship, the constitution said that all indigenous lands in Brazil should be demarcated from 1988 in five years, so to 19, 
look, my math is great, as you can see. <laughs> uh, 93. <laughs> and basically, that didn't happen. All of these lands are waiting to be demarcated. And the Constitution says it should be demarcated. And there are hundreds of processes right now completely stopped because of Bolsonaro. The deadlock of the process is not the only problem indigenous communities are facing in Brazil. There is a strong discrepancy between the legal aspect and the practice. Some communities are still struggling to have their land demarcated or the illegal occupiers removed from those areas nowadays. Illegal mining and logging, illegal farming on indigenous people's recognized territory, assassinations and violence are lasting problems which are still endangering the indigenous as individuals and as collectivities. According to the Federal University of Minas Gerais, between 2019 and 2020, almost 49 tons of metals were extracted illegally from indigenous people's lands or protected lands. This illegal mining often leads to river pollution with mercury waste a problem which is especially, but not only, threatening indigenous populations' health and lifestyle. Unfortunately, there are no actions taken by the government to diminish this problem. In fact, many experts and indigenous representatives accuse the government of turning a blind eye on the situation. Ms. Cherbazi also expressed the NGO's opinion on the topic. The presidency of Bolsonaro has been widely criticized abroad and nationally about how his government dealt with indigenous peoples. What are the main points of tensions about his presidency? As mentioned, like Bolsonaro has in this past four years done almost everything he could to destroy indigenous rights. Since the dictatorship, there hasn't been such direct and horrible attacks on indigenous rights in Brazil. Uh, the invasions of indigenous land never saw such high numbers of invasions. The same for mining in indigenous territories, the same for deforestation, the same for fires. It's really, really shocking to see how much destruction was made in this four years. And that's, of course, in the climate part of things. But in the rights part of things, because all of this is connected, they have tried everything that they could. So, for example, in the first day of his mandate, one of the first things he tried to do was to remove FUNAI from the Justice Ministry and put FUNAI inside this new ministry that he created called the Mulher Família de Direitos Humanos, Women, Family and Human Rights, and basically, after a lot of protests, this was did not went through. Because at the same time, he also tried to put the demarcation of indigenous lands under the um, agriculture ministry. So it's literally, you know, it, it was one of the main moments that was obvious what his plans in the first day of mandate, what his plans for indigenous rights and indigenous lands were. The FUNAI, Fundação Nacional do Índio, was supposed to be an essential independent institution for the protection of indigenous communities. Founded in the 80s during the redemocratization process, with the promulgation of the new constitution, the mandate of the institution was to ensure that the land protection and distribution rights of the indigenous peoples were respected. Naming France at the head of this institution was perceived as a setback for the security of indigenous peoples' rights. Another controversial point is about the interpretation of the Constitution. Bolsonaro and his government supported the push towards a problematic interpretation of the Constitution, which is undermining the implementation of indigenous people's rights in Brazil, the Marco Temporal. But what is it, and what does it mean for the indigenous peoples? Marco Temporal is a way of reading the Constitution. Basically, the Marco Temporal thesis wants to make a rule for the demarcation. So the rule would be that only indigenous lands where indigenous people were living at the time of the signature of the constitution would be demarcated. So basically, if a people was not in their land in 1988, this land wouldn't be demarcated. Of course, that this would 
make the demarcation of hundreds of indigenous territories completely impossible because these people were not there, not because they didn't want to, but because they were expelled in a very, very horrible ways. This controversial and problematic interpretation of the constitution was supported by Bolsonaro in consistency with his anti-indigenous and pro-agro-industry stance throughout his term. The land grabbing in the Amazon and selling those lands has only made the poor states lose out on much needed tax revenue. The land grabbing and number of unscrupulous loggers peaked during his presidency and also it made them legitimize and justify their actions which were backed up by the existing conditions and values. According to the Amazon Environmental Institute, 32% of undesignated public forest had been grabbed by 2020. If the Marco Temporal were accepted, a significant portion of the illegally grabbed land would be legalized and it would be detrimental to many indigenous communities. At the very least, Bolsonaro's presidency was not a great period for indigenous people's rights. But how about the next one? Elected on the 30th of October this year, Luis Ignacio Lula da Silva is making his return as the president for the next four years. How will he deal with the indigenous people? We have to acknowledge and know that, unfortunately, the previous Lula governments and the Juma government were not an amazing moment for indigenous people at all. Uh, it was a many moments of intense uh, fights for their rights as well. Uh, one of the biggest and more known examples is Belo Monte Dam that was literally uh, destroyed because the water overtook entire indigenous lands. It has never been easy under any government in Brazil. And this is one thing that we have to make sure that people understand as an international NGO, that we pressure every single government. We never will shy away from exposing any wrong things. And in during the Lula government was the same. So now the thing is that we'll have probably a better ground to work with because we hope that uh, he won't do, you know, a third of the horrible try that Bolsonaro did and that the constitution will be more followed. For example, the Marco Temporal, I would say it's one of the main topics that uh, will be very interesting to see how Lula will manage. But what we can already know is that it won't be easy because right now he is already officialized that there will be an indigenous ministry. That's an amazing win for indigenous people. If this ministry has power and can actually act on the issues to do with indigenous people. Criticizing the actions or inaction of a given government is insufficient. The hopes about the positive attitude of the newly elected President Lula might not be sufficient to address the systemic and structural issues like discrimination, land grabbing or illegal mining. Unfortunately, those are deeply rooted in Brazilian society, politics and economy. Having said that, any political goodwill is always welcome and could be a thriving force in the era Incoming. We hope that the questions of indigenous human rights and indigenous people in Brazil have piqued their interest. During the podcast, we gave a panorama on the history and advocacy of indigenous rights on the international system. As we could observe, there has been a lot of improvement in the last 40 years. The main obstacle now is to make the states cooperate and follow international treaties as the UNDRIP. The Brazilian case brings light not only to the lack of willingness that states have in securing the well-being of indigenous populations, but also that some governments work systematically against their rights. In this respect, social media are now a new space of advocacy where they can interact with international public opinion more directly. While embracing the codes of the younger generations, this might be a new era for indigenous committed influencers. For example, you can follow on Instagram and Twitter Darío Copenawa from the Yanomami people or Sonia Guajajara, the first indigenous congresswoman in Brazil's history. This new domain of advocacy deserves a podcast in itself. Maybe our next time. Hope you enjoyed today's podcast. Until next time.